Hello everyone, welcome to the first of a three-part podcast or lecture series, I suppose you could call it if you want, on the subject of a cosmovision, what primarily basically exploring what a cosmovision actually is. And to do that we're going to be uh, talking also about uh, the Maya civilization and their sacred text, the Popol Vuh. But the first thing we're going to do is talk about what a cosmovision actually is. And we've got to define that really. We've got to work out what we, what, what we mean by it. Now the root of the word is in two other words. first word cosmos, the second word vision. So you can split it into the two. And it's a combination of, uh, etymologically, uh, it's, it's, it's a combination of the Greek cosmos, which means order or world, and which we now s- understand as universe, and also a Latin word, videre, meaning to see. So, in essence, the word cosmovision means to see the universe. What it does is it captures how the universe is understood, how it's witnessed, how it's experienced by either an individual, a particular person, or a group of people. Uh, They could be the same ethnic group, could be the same cultural group, uh, or it could be the same civilization or group of civilizations. Yeah. So, in essence, the word cosmovision means to see the universe, as I say. Now, you could say, well, why don't you use the word worldview? That's kind of what it means. One of the reasons I don't use it is because the English world word word view is quite materialistic in a way. It's it is it is about how we see the world, but it seems to be stripped really of any possible interaction with non material entities, non-material beings, so spiritual beings don't form a part of our worldview really. So, but in a cosmovision, it seems, well, maybe it's just a question of preference really on my part. Um, but yeah, for, for me, cosmovision seems more holistic, it, it encompasses a possibility of interaction with spiritual beings. Why is that important? Well over the next few weeks what we're going to be doing is talking about uh, historical peoples or peoples in history who regularly daily in on a daily basis interacted with spiritual beings non-material beings um these spiritual beings played a huge part in their lives they well they were the source of life. They're also the source of death, I suppose. Or, or well, we, we'll come back to that point later. Um, yeah, creation couldn't exist without them. Uh, yeah, and the peoples we're going to be studying over the course of the, of the next few weeks couldn't possibly have conceived of a, of a universe without interactions with spiritual beings to suggest that they didn't happen these interactions didn't happen would be completely absurd to these people so this is something we're going to have to grapple with over the next few weeks but yeah this is why I choose the word cosmovision because it cosmos seems much bigger than than world is to see to see the universe how we experience the universe how that universe is experienced by the historical peoples we're going to be talking about But what we're going to do over the next three podcasts is to see if we can understand more about this by using the case study of the Mayan civilization and the sacred text, the Popol Vuh, as I say. What I'll do is to give you a historical and contextual overview of the Maya and the source itself so that we can then apply that knowledge uh, in later discussions. Okay, so to see the universe... The reason I I chose the Popol Vuh in particular uh, as a starting point for the module is because for the Kichin Maya, the Popol Vuh is what, what they called an Ilbal. Translated literally, it's a seeing instrument. And you might think, well, what on earth does that mean? How can a text be a seeing instrument? 
Well, effectively, it's talking about how the text is used. And actually, the word text is a bit problematic. Um, because that's a kind of later... A, a later medium. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's talking about how how this sacred text was used anyway what do I mean well histor for historians we can gain a, a, some sense of the historical development of the Mayan peoples as well as an overview of how they view, viewed the world around them so we, we can glean some information uh, that way using the text but at a much more complex level and also for my initiates by close study of the, the text it's possible to gain an insight into an intimate relationship between the heavens of the earth so the agricultural cycles that, inter that are intimately collect connected to the movement of astral bodies through the sky of planets stars as, the, as, as they move um, so as well as being what we consider here and now to be an origin myth and a history in a broad sense of the term it is, or it was, also a complex calendar and sky map that only highly trained diviners could and can correctly interpret. Now, I can't do that. I can only touch upon it. Um, I'm, I'm going to be referring to a translated version. It's a version of the pop of a translated by Dennis Tedlock. Um, and he, he knows a lot more. I'm following his interpretation for this because he's been researching it his entire career but still he he admits he doesn't have the same insights that one of these diviners or or, or day keepers has uh, so essentially the popul is, is a really complex code and it's pretty much locked up to all but a few and i wouldn't be surprised if, if even then there's a great deal of knowledge that has associated with the popover that's actually been lost that even the day keepers don't have access to so yeah where do we start well this is where I'll go to uh, Ted Locke's uh, Ted Locke's translation and he starts in a pretty good place in his discussion of it and it's the creation of the first four men of maize and he explains the rationale of the book in this in, in this introduction he says he, he quotes the first four humans the first four earthly beings who were truly articulate when they moved their feet and hands their faces and mouths and who could speak the very language of the gods could also see everything under the sky and, and on the earth all they had to do was look around from the spot where they were to the limits of space and time but then the gods, who had not intended to make and model beings with the potential of becoming their own equals, limited human sight to what was obvious and nearby. Nevertheless, the lords who once ruled a kingdom from a place called Quiche, in the highlands of Guatemala, once had in their possession the means for overcoming this nearsightedness, an ilbal, a seeing instrument. Now, you might be still thinking what is this seeing instrument it's not a telescope it's not a mirror it's not even a scrying glass as we might commonly expect to see in european pre-christian and anti-christian cultures it's a text well a text loosely uh, defined uh, called the popol vuh and this the lords of Quiche could consult if they wanted to understand particular events and place them in their proper context. Yeah, they could look at the details to understand specific events in depth. And if they wanted to see the cosmic significance of whatever it was they needed to understand, they'd place it in the context of a performance of the entire work. That's why I say text loosely interpreted, because it's about performance. Um, so you might ask, well, how, how is this possible? We have to bear in mind that the text that's come down to us today is was a copy made by a Dominican friar, a Spanish friar, called Francisco Jimenez, roughly between the years 1701 and 1703. He was parish. Uh, he came across the manuscript in his parish of Chichicastenango, but 
in fact it was written by Mayan authors, anonymous authors who wanted to r remain anonymous um, probably in San Juan de Quiche uh, between the years 1553 and 1558 and we know this because of the genealogical lists that appear in the final part of the Popol Vuh now these authors wanted to remain anonymous um, it says in the text itself those who ponder it wish to hide their faces um, and the reason they wanted to remain anonymous was most likely to protect themselves from the very serious con consequences of being accused of, be uh, of idolatry and also to protect the very knowledge that the, te that the narrative contained from destruction um, so yeah, they they themselves these these Kiche, um authors uh, put it into transcribed it into the Latin text, even though it stayed it remained in the uh, in the Kiche language. But what Jimenez didn't have access to and wouldn't have understood anyway when he copied down this manuscript with the complex calendric and pictographic codes that would have accompanied the narrative and would have allowed the diviners to correctly pl place particular events in a universal context. So the bottom line is that the Popol Vuh narrative was accompanied by very complex tables and was, in the words of Tedlock, a complex navigation system for those who wish to see and move beyond the present, either back into the past, so you can see see what's happened or into the future so you can predict what will will happen now this is where I need to introduce you to another concept that I'll that will be coming up time and again in in, in this series of uh, podcast talks or lectures and uh, in our discussions and that is to do with the nature of time almost without exception for the indigenous peoples of the Americas time was cyclical and it wasn't linear as we tend to understand it these days in modern Europe. Now, it plays out in different ways depending on the culture or civilization, but time and the events that take place in them are considered to repeat themselves. Now, I'll borrow one way of explaining it from a close colleague of mine, it's Luke Clossy from Simon Fraser University of British Columbia, and he told his students, I thought this was really clever, uh, to think of a piano keyboard so if you think of a piano keyboard, those of you that are musical, and those of you that aren't, I'll demonstrate it now on an accordion. Every eight keys, every octave, the note is the same, but it's also different if you listen to it. If they're played together, they've got what Luke Clossy called consonants. In reality, what happens is the octave notes have, have this so-called cons consonants because the air vibrates with either double or half the frequency so they kind of m map onto each other But in terms of this analogy, uh, it can work in a similar way. So if we're thinking in, in, cycl in, t in terms of cyclical time, the dates themselves have consonants. They, they, they play out in the same pattern or similar patterns at least. So they've got the same deities, the same rituals, the same occurrences, the same consequences. But you can also notice a difference. So you've got different mortal beings, possibly different places, although not necessarily, they could be the same places. So yeah, uh, that might be one way to understand this idea of cyclical time. Think of it in terms of notes on a piano keyboard. They sound the same, but they're not quite the same. So cyclical time is very similar in that, in that regard. It seems the same, but it's also slightly different. Now, another thing to mention here, we tend to think of, think that time is linear. Historians do that all the time. They talk in terms of chronology, genealogy, timelines. But in actual fact, not too long ago, most Europeans thought of time in quite cyclical ways as well. 
it's based on the ritual calendar uh, thinking about Europe particularly Western Europe it would have been the Christian calendar and that's synchronized with the agricultural seasons as well so everything is cyclical uh, based on when the planting takes place uh, what rituals take place at, at certain moments uh, when Christ was born when Christ died um, and all the moments in time that are mapped onto the liturgical year uh, that also map onto uh, the calendric way of life of the peoples that followed this belief system so yeah even in Europe time was thought of by a lot of people as cyclical it was understood as cyclical now for a significant number of indigenous American civilizations and also many Asian civilizations too although I can't really talk about them because I don't know too much about them this cyclical time intimately links life and death into a single whole made up of two parts and I'll come back to this dualism later on but the end of the cycle however long that might take because it's different for different civilizations is brought about by a cataclysmic destruction or death but this death gives way to or brings about the rebirth of new life so the world and life within it will have been created destroyed and reborn numerous times now with respect to the Maya these cycles are very clear in the Popova even if you don't have the complex tables I mentioned to hand so even if you've got not got this you've not got the uh, the tables and you don't you don't really know the precise uh, divisions if you read through the text you can see how similar patterns are repeated so yeah to return to kind of this idea of uh, using the popover as a seeing instrument the popover or reading in a divinatory way as, as Tedlock suggests it was a way of as he says recovering the depth of vision enjoyed by the first four humans so these are the ones who would had that vision taken from them by the gods they could see too far so the gods took it away from them um, and so it's only through the popol vuh that they can uh, understand what has happened what is happening and what might happen in the future so it's a narrative that's performed as a theater and a a long performance was a way of recovering that full cosmic sweep of that vision and so that's where I'll leave the first uh, part and the next part we'll move on to talking about historical context for for the Popol Vuh and for the Maya <laughs>